Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Namo Dasa Bhagavato Arahato Sama Sambu Dasa Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Homage to the blessed, noble, and perfectly enlightened one. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Allahudi Samyao Sanputoshe. Namo Sadanto Suchedoye Allahudi Samyao Sanputoshe. Ushang Shen Shen Wei Miao Fa. Bai Chen Wan Jie Nan Sao Yi. Supreme and wondrous Dharma, subtle and profound, rarely is encountered even in billions of eons. But now we see and hear it and accept it reverently. May we truly understand the Buddha's actual meaning. Shifu Shangren, Gowei, Shishung, Dajia, Amitofo. Venerable Master, Dharma friends, good evening. Welcome to our Sutra lecture tonight. Glad you could make it. Glad you're all here. Uh, both our friends who are here in person, I get to see real faces looking back at me over the tops of masks, but I'll take it. That's okay. Some old friends whom I haven't seen in years and years. Welcome back. Glad to see you all. Uh, we're honored with our elders. Uh, the Espinoza family is here. And we have some young folks here as well who are laying down a good foundation for hearing the Dharma. And uh, we have a special welcome for them from... You know, the year of the tiger is going away. Uh, I kind of miss it, but uh, it hasn't been a good year for most of us. So uh, maybe you won't be, won't be sorry to see my backside, maybe. I don't know, but uh, uh, I'll just stay here with the monk if that's all right. So. Uh, see you in 11 years, all right? Yeah, all right. Uh, happy New Year, everybody. Yeah, so. All right. We've got a, we'll have a greeting from the, the, on, the incoming year. <laughs> That's later. Okay. So, um, appreciate the friends who are helping translate what I'm saying in English into Chinese. Uh, they're doing that in Australia. Uh, there will be about uh, 80 folks listening from China and from Taiwan, Singapore, Hong Kong, Malaysia, who want to hear in Chinese. Furthermore, there are friends who are translating my English words into Vietnamese as well. So if uh, people would like to hear a Vietnamese translation, there is a way to do that. Uh, we're working on our Spanish translation. That's in the future. We hope to have a translation of my words in English into Spanish. Of course, the best would be if I did that myself, but that's going to be a while before my Spanish is good enough to, uh, to pass, so people will be able to uh, understand what I say. So, also we want to thank the friends who are putting, my, uh, putting this whole thing out, not only onto Zoom, but also onto YouTube. So, we've got uh, technology working on our side. So uh, we 
are, this is, for, for more than half of the world, this is a special night because it's Lunar New Year's night. Uh, New, Lunar New Year's Eve. Lunar New Year's Eve. Some people say Chinese New Year's, but it's way more than that. It, in uh, Vietnam, it's Tet, right? T-E-T. -E we used to say the Tet Offensive back in those days. Now, it, I was corrected. It's Dat, which is Vietnamese for New Year's. And uh, for uh, if you were raised in the Vietnamese community, traditionally, uh, oh, this was... The, big, the end of, of all of the stuff you wanted to get behind you and the beginning of all of the future ahead of you, all the good things that were possible. This was, uh, tomorrow is when they start. So, big day, big day. Uh, as I mentioned last week, uh, I had the chance to go through the whole cycle of New Year's uh, in Taiwan one year. Ten days. It's ten days. And boy, let me tell you how important that holiday is. For example, in Taiwan, all the stores are closed. If you didn't buy your food uh, this last week, you're, you have to go to the night markets and you might, you might not find anything. It's all of the business. The shop owners are home celebrating New Year's. So you have to, everybody prepares and stocks up uh, beforehand. And then on tomorrow, the Lunar New Year's, New Year's Day, Oh boy, uh, that's when, uh, when all the fun begins. So that's uh, tonight. So because of that, we're going to do a little, slightly different lecture than usual, but uh, I'll, we'll get there in a minute. I'll tell you about that. Let's continue with our... Uh, oh, let's see. Since I've already said that, let's talk about what we're going to do. I'll say it now, and then I'll say it at the end of the lecture too. Because of COVID, we're still in COVID protocols here. We haven't completely opened up uh, back to where we were before the pandemic started. So tomorrow, if... Uh, every family who has a connection with Buddhism and even some who don't, the first day of the new year, what you do is you go to the temple. You go to the monastery, you go to the, the shrine, and you light incense. And you hope for a lucky New Year. That's what everybody does. And so we thought it'd be right for us to keep our door open for folks to come tomorrow who want to bow, who want to offer incense, and uh, start the year out right, right, with good luck. So we will be of open starting... What did we say, Jim Fosher? Nine o'clock? Nine, nine a.m. Uh, don't come earlier. You'll have to wait outside. <laughs> so we're still scurrying around getting ready, you know. So uh, come at nine o'clock, if you like, or later, also okay. And uh, until uh, 1030, and we'll be here to talk to everybody. You can, you know, we'll be sitting here talking. Um, come and light incense and bow. Then we're going to close the door. Uh, monks are going to have lunch. And now ordinarily that would be the big lunch for everybody. Not tomorrow. So you're going to have to go patronize Long Life Restaurant or wherever you'd like, someplace, some close vegetarian restaurant. Long Life is good. They have really yummy food. Come back at 12.30. 12.30, Jin Foshir is going to be leading everybody to recite the Buddha's name. That's online. He does that every day. So tomorrow is no different. Um, then uh, we're going to let people trickle in in the afternoon. Uh, some people want extra luck and they go to all the temples. They go temple hopping, right? It's like the Buddha didn't notice them there. So they're going to go just in case the Buddha wasn't looking, you know, maybe. So, or luckier here, you know, the monks really work there. So we go there. So. So some people will trickle in 3 o'clock or so. So that's fine. We'll be here. But then about 5 o'clock, we'll close the door. And uh, you'll have to make your own luck. So that's the plan for tomorrow. So, All right. That's Sunday. Then tomorrow night, you can tune in online for another sutra lecture for the real... 
the Rio lovers of the Avatamsaka Sutra. Okay, so that's tomorrow. We'll repeat the, that schedule at the end of the lecture tonight. Okay, should we invoke our spiritual presence here? I think uh, the banjo has kept its tuning. Let's see here. We're going to invoke the presence of the Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Here we go. Let's see here, we'll bring up our sutra, which is right here. Just to let everybody know where we are in our text, we're, we're explaining a really long sutra, big, big text. And uh, we're in chapter 20. There are 39 total chapters. We're halfway through. The, uh, the Buddha has come to a palace and he's... Uh, can everybody see? The Buddha is uh, going... He's about to explain a particular teaching called the Ten Practices. And so... Bodhisattvas, these uh, saints, have come to that place to welcome the Buddha and to praise him. And so we've heard nine of those Bodhisattvas sing their praises. And there's uh, one to go, one more. And we're in the middle of his praises. Make it easier to see if it's bigger, huh? Okay, there we go. Big, big. All right. So these, uh, each of these bodhisattvas are singing their hearts out. They're, they're praising the Buddha with a very interesting variety of things they're saying. So this one, his name is, each of these bodhisattvas is called forest, forest of something. So forest of knowledge, in this case, forest of knowledge. And he says, you ready? Want to join me? Piru sui ju. Piru sui yi chu nang xian yi che si xian yi che si wu si er xian si zhu fo yi ru shi just like the wish fulfilling gem which can make any form appear 
seemingly from nowhere. The Buddhas are also the same. Okay. Now, there is uh, this amazing phenomenon in, uh, in Buddhism called the Ruiju, the wish-fulfilling pearl. And it's, it's part of Buddhism, but it also appears in, just in culture, uh, ancient literature, ancient stories, um, folklore, uh, non-Buddhist teachings in, in Hinduism. Um, there's this thing called the wish-fulfilling pearl, wish-fulfilling jewel. And the, uh, we <laughs> so I grew up as a Christian and we didn't have dragons. <laughs> we didn't have dragons in Christianity except uh, somehow the folklore in Europe uh, had talked about dragons. St. George and the dragon, we had that story. But when you get to ancient, ancient civilizations and the, the civilizations of China has been straight through for 5,000 years, uh, the, the civilizations of Iran, Persia, right? The Phoenicians, the Mesopotamians, the Greeks, they go back a long, long time ago. The Incas, the Mayans of Mexico and uh, Central America, those are ancient civilizations. They have dragons. So if you go back before, you know, we talk about history. Well, what is history? History is just a story that the winners wrote about the people they defeated. And there's a lot of history to learn that goes back before history started being written down. Where do we find it? We find it in legends. We find it in folklore, kind of the oldest stories of our tribe. And it's interesting to think that uh, the Mayans and the Incans who lived in uh, what, is what we now call Latin America also had dragons. So when we look at the Chinese, the Chinese have dragons. The Indians have dragons. The ancient tribes of Europe have dragons. Modern people, we think, oh, I haven't seen a dragon. Science hasn't found a dragon. Show me a dragon, then I'll believe it. You know, how big are they? What color are they? You know, is there one in this, the uh, Seattle Zoo? You know, is there one in the Kansas City Zoo? Then I'll believe it. St. Louis? So science doesn't talk about dragons, but what do they say? Something like 85% of all the scientists who've ever lived are still alive. What does that mean? Science is new. Science gives us all kinds of benefits. It measures things. It tells us. It keeps us alive. You know, it got us through COVID. Uh, with a million people dead in this country, and now China is suffering hugely. But science brings lots of benefits. But to say that if science doesn't recognize it or doesn't exist, that's to miss uh, most of the knowledge of our tribe. 85% of the scientists who've ever lived are still alive because it's brand new. In the long span of human history, science has just been here measuring things for that part. All of this part of human civilization is found in the old stories. What do the old stories say? They say dragons are real. So China is one of those places where that history is still intact. There's one right there. <laughs> There's one right there. There's one right there. There's one right there. There are four dragons in those windows. There are two dragons on here. And you can't see it because... Now, if you were outside, you could see it because... It's night, the light is shining out. But every one of these dragons has a pearl. If you, uh, let's see here, right behind me on this altar, on our bookshelf, uh, there are dragons carved into the, into the wood. And here in downtown Berkeley, we're keeping most of the dragons in downtown Berkeley or in this building. Most of Berkeley's dragons are here. So I'm pre pleased to say, so they're Buddhist dragons. They're probably, uh, uh, they're, if you're not a Buddhist, they welcome you anyway. So what about dragons and pearls? Part of the story. This is the old stories, the old stories. And as I say, I grew up as a Methodist. We didn't have dragons. But the culture that gave rise to Christianity did. 
That was the culture outside of the faith that gave birth to the faith. When you go to talk to the elders, you hear these stories. You find it in the, in the, the, the ancient, you know, folk, folk tales and such. So I learned it later. Do I see dragons? I don't. I don't see dragons. But I know some people who will tell you they do. Uh, are, you a, are you a cloud dragon watcher? There's some people who like, they're always looking for dragons in the clouds. You one of those people? Yeah, yeah, some people nodding their heads, yeah. So like, oh, you know. That was a great, we had a retreat. We came out after seven days and well, there they were up in the sky, you know. I don't, I don't do that so much, but uh, I know there are people who really, you know, enjoy that. Okay, fine. So my job as a person telling these stories is just not to judge. The, the, if you ask the question, true or false, you're not going to know. That's not the question to ask. The question that I ask is, what can I learn? Is there something to learn from the presence of spiritual animals that my eyes don't see? Maybe. Maybe. What are the stories? Let me listen with a non-judgmental mind and see what I can learn. See what there is to learn about that. Certainly, the people who were alive and paying attention 5,000 years ago said, yeah, we, we see the dragons, we respect them, and here's what they're like. They told us the color. They're red, they're green, they're blue. They say they're dragons that travel in the sky, travel in the water, that travel on the earth. They say that dragons, the thing they love the most are these pearls, the wish-fulfilling pearl, that they're never separated from them until they meet the Buddha. And then there's this famous story in Buddhism about who? The dragon girl. Okay? It's, you all know this story, right? If you, uh, if you look at Guanyin Bodhisattva, our Guanyin doesn't have the two children. Often you'll see Guanyin Bodhisattva who looks like the Blessed Virgin. She looks like the Virgin Mary. She's got these two children beside her. One is a picture of Sudana, our pilgrim from the Avatamsaka, our sutra. The other is clearly a little girl. That's the dragon girl. And the story goes, she's a dragon, but she loves her pearl the most because that's, it's the source of wisdom. What does it say? It makes things appear. It can conjure all kinds of shapes and colors, and yet they come out of nowhere. She met the Buddha and said, I want to cultivate, here's my pearl. The thing she loved the most, she was willing to give to the Buddha in exchange for him teaching her how to cultivate for wisdom. That's what she wanted. The Buddha said, oh, I will accept this and I'll tell you, you're going to become a Buddha in the future. You will succeed. He said this to this young daughter of the dragon king, they said. Uh, and so all the other male, all the other men, the arhats around the Buddha, hey, wait a minute, wait a minute. We've been cultivating beside you for 15 years, 20 years. You never gave us a prediction to enlightenment. How come this little girl, she's a girl, she shouldn't get this. What's this? The Buddha said, well, where's your pearl? <laughs> you didn't sacrifice anything. She sacrificed the thing that meant the most to her for her wisdom so she could learn to cultivate. I can teach her. She really wants to learn. I can teach her. You're so full of yourselves, you know, you may have seniority, you may have the years, but you haven't, your priorities are still on the self, not on wisdom. So that's the famous story. She later, Guan Yin Bodhisattva, started getting painted with the dragon girl beside her. So. Dragons love their pearls most of all, and yet when the time comes, they're able to let them go, their priorities shift. They realize there's something really worth having in the world that doesn't have shape or form, and that's wisdom. And you cultivate it from your good heart, from kindness, from compassion. That's where it comes from, from learning right from wrong, and then doing, living right from wrong. That's how 
That's how you cultivate. And so that's, that's this old story about the wish-fulfilling pearl. So I say, instead of judging and saying, oh, true or false, that's not the question to ask. The question to ask is, what can I learn from stories about wish-fulfilling pearls? You know, and what do I cling to most of all? And would I be willing to let that go in exchange for something priceless like wisdom, knowing what to do in every situation so that you're not wrong and that everybody benefits? That's, that's the question. Okay, that's our sutra. We're going to move on now to... Maitreya Bodhisattva. Take a look. Uh, I need to, to back up a little bit. Tomorrow, as I said, is the new year. This is the year of the rabbit. We're leaving the year of the tiger. And I remember, uh, well, I'll never forget, <laughs> one year at City of 10,000 Buddhas. It was New Year's Day. And up there, of course, this wasn't COVID time. Everybody gets in a bus, and they bus up from San Jose, and they bus up from San Francisco, and they bus over from Sacramento, and they bus down from Seattle, even from L.A., to spend Sunday or the day of Lunar New Year's. If it's a Monday or a Friday, they take off work, you know, because the Western calendar doesn't pay any attention to Chinese New Year's, right? It's just another day. But if you come from that culture, you want to be together on that first day, offer incense at the temple. So here we are, lunchtime at City of 10,000 Buddhas. There was, it was full. There was 500 people there. there were, you know, they, they put double rows of chairs facing each other, so not just facing the, the altar, but facing backwards so they could double the capacity of the dining hall and everybody's crowded in like this, you know. You can't move, but everybody had a full plate of food and and uh, good energy. So uh, I was sitting there, and Master Hua was our teacher sitting in the, his seat. And I was eating my eating lunch and thinking, wow, these people really get motivated for New Year's, huh? And what do they say on New Year's? And I kind of half heard it, because it's not my holiday. My holiday is Christmas. And New Year's is January 1st, not Lunar New Year's. So I didn't know. So I kind of imitate what I see and hear. So comes time to speak Dharma. Master Hua looks over and says, Gojan, you talk. So I thought, oh, oh good, here's my chance. <laughs> Sit back, you know. And I go, Gong Shi Fa Cai. Shifu goes, no! Monks don't say that! Okay. Hmm? What is Gung Shi Fa Tsai? Congratulations, hope you get rich. <laughs> I didn't know, I didn't know what you said. No. So, <laughs> I'll, oh, I'll never forget, man. My face turns red and then white and then red and then white and then red, you know. Oh, because it's not my holiday, I don't know, but Gong Shi Fa Tsai. So if you're in the world, if you're a business person, if you're like a normal, ordinary human being on Lunar New Year's, you say Gong Shi Fa Tsai. If you speak Cantonese, what do you say? Gong He Fa Choi, right? Gong He Fa Choi. What do you say in Vietnamese? Louder? There you go. Once again. Nam hai phat thai. Yeah. Kung shi phat thai. Same. Yeah. So, but monks don't say that. You don't say, hope you get rich. That's not what monks say, you know. So what do you say if you're a monk? You say things like, you know, guo nian xin xi, xin nian ji xiang, ji xiang ru yi, wan shi ru yi, things like that. May, may, all, may everything come to success. May this year be very auspicious, you know. But not worldly money, gong shi fa tsai. So I didn't know. Well, now I know. <laughs> so I don't say that anymore. Oh. So, Happy New Year. Uh, but on this day, 
what the Buddhists have on the calendar is a birthday. We have a birthday of one of our important individuals who is Maitreya Bodhisattva, also known as Maitreya Buddha. But here's the funny thing, and this is what I want to show everybody. Some people, probably most people, uh, oh, I, I got a, this, this is story night, so I'll tell you a story. So uh, let me show you what most people see when they see, when they think Maitreya, right? They think this guy, right? There's Maitreya. And you can also, is it clear enough? Can you see him? There he is, okay. So who's this? This is called the Happy Buddha, the Laughing Buddha, the Fat Buddha, okay? All these different names. Most people see him and go, oh yeah, yeah, that's the Buddha. And that's what they know, is the Buddha is supposed to look like this, they think. And for sure, if you were in the US Navy and your ship made port in Hong Kong, and you wandered a cat a day, you had a shore leave, and you go wandering, you stop into a shop and you buy one of these. You take it home, you put it on the mantle, and you, your grandma sees it, and you know, oh, that's, that's the Buddha, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's kind of fat. <laughs> he must eat really well at the temple, you know? All that vegetarian food, you know? So, and he's got, he's got money here, he's got his beads, and he has a bag. He's got a bag, like, kind of like Santa Claus. Uh, Jin Fo sure last in your Thursday night lecture, you had images of Maitreya on your altar here, yeah. So what else? He also sometimes looks like this, surrounded by kids. Happy Buddha, right? People all recognize, well, who is this? He is the Buddha, but it's funny because there's another Maitreya Bodhisattva who doesn't look like this. Sometimes, boy, you want to mix the marketplace and Buddhism? <laughs> Money, you know? And he looks really fat. You think, boy, this guy could use a little bit of exercise, maybe. No. So, okay. So, most dining halls, our dining hall here has Maitreya, some of them can be kind of scary, like world domination Maitreya, you know. <laughs> like, I'm not so sure about this one. So, so uh, okay. Now, I'm going to confuse things. I'm going to confuse you, all right? Because why? Maitreya Bodhisattva shows up in our sutra, in our flower garland, Avatamsaka Sutra. And what does he look like? He looks like this. Now, what do you say about him? First of all, he's got a mustache. Second of all, he looks like he grew up somewhere maybe in Persia, maybe in Greece. This is a, a Buddha image. This is Maitreya, same figure but why does he look so different? He's wearing sandals. He's not fat. He doesn't have kids around him. He doesn't, or he's not sitting on piles of money, right? So, huh, what about that? Like I say, confusing, huh? Like, who is this? All right, let's take a look. We got him too. Look at that. That's a Western face, isn't it? So, this is Maitreya Bodhisattva, sculpted by, this is the, the part of in, where India meets the Greek, Greek civilization, called Gandhara. It's the farthest west part of India. Afghanistan, before it, it, was, it became Islamic, before it was Muslim, was Buddhist. This comes from Afghanistan. These are Afghani, what we would now call Afghanistan, but they're Buddhas, Buddha images, right? Check out the sandals. All right, that's Maitreya. So you think, what in the world is going on here? How come he looks so different than the fat Buddha? 
And are they both, how can they both be the same? Well, here he is. This is Maitreya. Now, my, my awareness, look at that. That's, that's a Buddha, right? My awareness of this came from um, a visit that I took to China um, out to Wu Taishan, out in the far west of China. Wu Taishan, Five Peaks Mountain. And uh, this is a place where our sutra, the very sutra we're explaining tonight, is, is located. Uh, there's a temple there called Hua Yan Si, Avatamsaka Monastery. And when we visited, one of our guides had been out there before, and he knew that temple. And he said, oh, he says, you like the Avatamsaka, right? I said, yeah. He said, you want to see Maitreya? I said, yeah, I've seen Maitreya. He's, he's in the dining room. He's big. And, no, 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 no. Come to the library. We've got an image of Maitreya. So we went into the library, and here was this life-size image that looked just like those. And they looked, I mean, they could have come out of Oregon, you know, or West Virginia or something. Because they were, he's tall, fit, Western features, has a mustache. <laughs> and you go, never seen Maitreya look like that. He says, yeah, this is the Maitreya from Avatamsaka Sutra. Oh, okay. Oh, I didn't know that. All right. So, what's different? What's different? Uh, then, what I've learned is Maitreya has multiple identities in our tradition. They say that Maitreya Bodhisattva is currently waiting for the conditions to arise so he can come down and be the next Buddha. Our, the story that we tell about the Buddhas is they come in a succession. Our current historical Buddha lived 2,500 years ago. His name was Shakyamuni Buddha. We still remember him. We still talk about the teachings that he gave us. So that's called our Buddha is Shakyamuni Buddha. There's a time when Buddhism will be gone, when it's over, when people just don't, they forget, you know. Just the way Christianity has evolved over the years. Back in the first century after Jesus Christ, you had to hide it out. If you said you were a Christian, the Roman emperor would come and nail you up on a cross, right? So Christianity has gone through many changes over the centuries, and it's continuing to change. Right now, mainstream Christianity, the, the, the church is losing its grip on culture, and instead, people are going to charismatic teachers, uh, so-and-so preacher, so-and-so holy man. They get a personal relationship with Jesus. When my parents grew up, you went to the church. You belonged to a church, and you didn't belong to that church. And, you know, in one neighborhood, there would be two churches, and you chose, you know. So now Christianity is going through changes. Buddhism is going through changes. Religion is morphing right now. So Buddhism at one point will be gone. They say there will be a period when there's no Dharma being taught, and then the Buddha, another Buddha returns. Who is it? Maitreya is waiting for that time. He's in the heavens now, they say, waiting to come down. That's how our story is told. So he's called what? Tang Lai Xia Sheng Mi Le Zun Fu. Maitreya, the honor Buddha who is waiting to come down. And he is uh, he's in, a, in a heaven called the Tushita Heaven, in the inner courtyard of the Tushita Heaven, because our legends say that at the end of a, a life, a, an a planet, a world has a lifespan too. People are born, they abide, mature, they age, they die and come back, says our tradition. Worlds go through the same. And at the end of a world's lifespan, they say, there are 
disasters, the disaster of fire, disaster of water, disaster of wind, and then it conditions come back and the planet begins fresh, the world begins again. That's, you know, these are old, old teachings about uh, how, how the world is built and how it changes. So in that scheme, if we, list, if we say, what can I learn from that? Currently, we're in that decay. We're in the autumn of our world. And, you know, the, uh, right now in Europe, in London, it's something like 60 degrees, 70 degrees. This is the warmest winter Europe has had in, since anybody can remember, which is good for the people of Ukraine because they're pretty much bombed into living outdoors. But the weather is out of cycle. So here, California, Joe Biden came to Santa Cruz this week. Anybody catch that? Did you notice? President Biden was standing at Capitola. He visited Soquel, just, you know, uh, around the corner from our new monastery down in Boulder Creek to in what? Inspect the flooding. They said uh, Mayor, uh, Gavin, uh, Governor Newsom was with him all day long. And uh, uh, Senator Padilla was there, you know, accompanying him. And because uh, why? We had floods, disasters of water. Maybe so. Maybe that time is coming faster than we know. Anyway, so Maitreya Bodhisattva is waiting to arrive. The story goes, this is how this, these, you know, this is how we tell our, our creation story. They say, when he comes back, he will teach for three days and three nights at the Dragon Flower Assembly, Long Hua Fa Hui. So if you want to be there when the next Buddha shows up, you've got to buy your ticket now. <laughs> Get ready, because he's not going to be teaching for long. Buddhas have different lifespans. So our Buddha taught for 49 years. Some Buddhas teach for eons. Maitreya plans to teach for three days and three nights. So the people who are supposed to be there should start to, to uh, think about Maitreya now. So these are just some of the old, old stories that keep popping up in our tradition. Meanwhile, meanwhile, what about this guy? What about him? So, does he look peaceful and happy? I hope so. We can move our, our zoom control panel. Gets in the way there. There we go. All right, now you can see him. Oops, no, hold on. There we go. Okay, there it is. So, uh, people know I did a pilgrimage at one point. Uh, I bowed to the ground every three steps, starting in South Pasadena, Traveling down, the what's called the Miracle Mile in uh, uh, from South Pasadena all the way to uh, to Santa Monica, right? And uh, took a month to get through L.A. Hit Santa Monica, turned north on Highway One, traveled up past Malibu, traveled up past Ventura. Traveled up past uh, Santa Maria, traveled up past Lompoc, Central California, Big Sur, Santa Barbara, all the way up to Monterey, Carmel. Then along right through Soquel and Capitola, right in Santa Cruz, then up Pescadero Coast, and then through San Francisco, and then uh, across the Golden Gate Bridge and through Marin, Sonoma, Mendocino County, to the city of 10,000 Buddhas. Took two years and nine months, two years and six months actually, and uh, about 800 miles. And uh, so we, we uh, bowed to the ground every third step and recited a prayer for world peace. And you might say it was a total failure because look how unpeaceful the world is, right? If you're looking for results, we didn't get them. The world was not more, much more peaceful. Maybe our hearts are more peaceful, but we didn't seem to have much impact on the world. Weren't sincere enough, anyway. So, bowing along, 
the, uh, uh, we were aware of, uh, we were maybe the first Buddhists that most people had ever seen. You know, who are these guys? What are they doing on my sidewalk? <laughs> you can't do that on my sidewalk. Hey, people had different, different reactions to seeing monks bow to the ground and, you know. So one Sunday, we were bowing through the city of Santa Cruz. And if people know, it's right where 101 and, and Highway 1 merge. They become one road. It's really, it's like super fast. And the uh, California Highway Patrol, who were our good friends, asked us, please, to, when we're going through the city, if we could take the side road. We could get into the neighborhood, so because they were afraid we would be a hazard to navigation, which is reasonable. So we got off of Mission Boulevard, which is 101 and 1, and we went down the neighborhood streets uh, for about uh, four days. So we got through Santa Cruz, and we went a mile a day. And one Sunday, uh, this little neighborhood, the there was a sidewalk where we were bowing, and then these houses had like 50-foot lots, and the, uh, the house was set up high, and you went up a couple steps to the front yard, and so the driveways were really steep. And we were bowing past a house, and this guy had parked his pickup truck on the steep driveway, and then pulled a handbrake, so it was like that. And we're bowing along, and I didn't, I didn't talk for the all the six years of our trip, I didn't, I didn't talk. I kept a vow of silence, trying to tune into my own mind during that time. But the other monk I was with, Marty, he talked. And uh, he, we had a, uh, we had a, uh, what's now called a one sheet. We had a piece of paper that talked about what we were doing. Oh, two Buddhist monks are bowing for the sake of world peace, doing a little bit of hard work on behalf of everyone, trying to make a more peaceful world. We don't solicit, we don't beg, we don't touch money, uh, and please, you know, don't bother us, basically. Uh, and so we had that printed out. So we're heading north on this residential street, paralleling Mission Boulevard there, and this guy comes to the door. And we figured he probably had had a little too much to drink the night before, and maybe he wasn't feeling so good, maybe he had a headache that morning, but he was like, not happy with us. So he comes to the door, he says, hey, hey, get off there. He says, you can't do that. Get off of my sidewalk. I don't want anybody kissing the sidewalk here in front of my house. You can't do that, you know. So we're like, mm, you know, keep bowing. And the guy didn't let go. He's like really upset. He slams the door. I told you to get off my sidewalk. You know, he's really getting up exercise now. And uh, he starts to, you know, he's like, he goes back inside his house, grabs his pickup truck keys, hops in the truck, turns it on, and I'm bowing past the driveway, he's prepared to back his truck down and squash me. And I'm under his rear tires, you know. So he's like, I told you not to do that. You know, so Hung Chao, Marty, my companion, takes one of those sheets, goes up to the guy's truck window, goes, hi, good morning, hi. We're uh, Buddhist monks. We're making a pilgrimage for world peace up to Ukiah. Uh, would you like one of our flyers? And the guy goes, what? What the hell? He says, Buddhist? Oh, oh, Buddha. He's a Buddha. Oh, he's the peace guy, right? Meaning him. Marty says, yeah, the peace guy. He says, oh. Oh, I got nothing against you guys. I thought you were that other group, you know, the ones that dance. No, oh, you're okay. The Give me one of those. You know, <laughs> takes the flyer, you know. So the peace guy saved our lives. So every time I see that, I think, okay, good. Saved my life anyway. And, uh, but he's funny because he's not, he's not the Buddha that 
Maitreya in history tells us this is the Japanese version of Maitreya. He's not fat at all, right? So what's going on here? So here's how Master Hua explains the difference. Our teacher explains it this way. He says, why is Maitreya this big? He's big, this is a, what they call iconographic image, meaning it's a picture. It's a picture of a principle which is the ability to not get angry. In order to not get angry, you have to take a lot of abuse and scorn and slighting. You have to take people's call it, calling you names, laughing at you, talking trash about you, and not get angry. And boy, that's hard. That's hard. It's called patience under insult. So this image, this guy is able to go through lots of abuse and scorn and ridicule and never get angry. They say, Du Da Nang Rong Rong Tian Xia Nan Rong Zhu His belly is big because he can hold Praise so hot and blame so cold. Kai ko bian xiao, xiao tian xia, ke xiao zhi ren. He splits his face in a smile so full at the situations he finds laughable. So that's Maitreya. He's not big because he eats so much. Probably he does eat a lot. Never turn down ice cream, kind of like Joe Biden, right? But He's big because he can hold anybody's chi without getting angry. So, he's called the old fool. The old fool wears tattered clothes, fills his belly with tasteless food, Patches his robe to keep out the cold, and as things come, so they go. His belly's big because he can hold praise so hot and blame so cold. Splits his face in a smile so full that the situations he finds laughable. The jewel of patience, it's a pearl so rare. Look at how foolish he is. Somebody scolds him, he just agrees. Yep, you're right. Somebody hits him, he falls down first on his knees. Spit in his face, he just lets it dry. He doesn't even wipe it off. He doesn't get upset, you save your energy. The jewel of patience, it's a pearl so rare. Now you've heard of this patience kung fu, Maitreya wants to share it with you. And if you set this aside and go seeking the Tao somewhere else, I've got to ask you, who's a real fool? Anyhow, because this is the real thing. This is religion you can use, right? The old fool wears tattered clothes, fills his belly with tasteless food, patches his robe to keep out the cold, and as things come, so they go, his belly's big cause he can hold. Praise so hot, blame so cold, splits his face in a smile so full. At the situations he finds laughable The jewel of patience, it's a pearl so rare If someone scolds the old fool 
he simply agrees. If someone hits the old fool, he smiles and falls down on his knees. Spit in his face, he lets it dry. He's not upset, you save your energy. The jewel of patience, it's a pearl so rare. His belly's big cause he can hold. Praise so hot, blame so cold. Splits his face in a smile so full that the situations he finds laughable. The jewel of patience, it's a pearl so rare. Computer break. Now you've heard of his patience, Gong Fu. Maitreya wants to share it with you. If you set this aside, go seeking the Tao. I gotta ask you, who's the old fool? Anyhow. So that's the old fool. And that explains the peace guy why his stomach is so big, why his belly is so big, it's because he can hold anybody's scorn, abuse, you know, stink eye, all that, and doesn't move. Now, there's another, okay, so what about this guy? We've heard about the, the chubby one, what about this one? He is the image that I was shown back in, uh, in China at Wu Tai Shan. This guy who looks so different. What's his story? So let me tell you. In, in our sutra, in this very same text that we have, here we are, right there. In this very own text that we have, there's a story uh, our pilgrim, I mentioned the dragon girl who uh, is there with Guan Yin, the, the young man who is there alongside the dragon girl is this pilgrim called Sudana, Shan Sai Tongzi, his name is. And he goes to all these teachers asking them how to cultivate the Bodhisattva path, how to practice Bodhisattva practices, how to be a selfless, good hearted person. And 49 of them give him answers. He, they point him to number 50. Number 50 is who? Maitreya. This very same bodhisattva, this very same saint. And Maitreya, uh, there's, they have a, a long, there's a long section where they meet, they talk to each other, and then Maitreya, he snaps his fingers, and this uh, jeweled pagoda, the Virochana Jeweled Pagoda opens up. Sudana gets enlightened. His, uh, I guess in Christian terms, we'd say he, uh, he attained sainthood right there. So it's a miracle story, but it's based on lots of hard work. So Sudana says to Maitreya, he says, hey, tell me how you got started on the path. How did you, Shen Fa Ta Putishin, when did you make the Bodhi resolve. So tell me your story, says the pilgrim who's just woke up. Maitreya says, and I'm going to read it for you, he says, You ask me where I come from. What does he say? He says, look, good man, 
you ask where I come from? He says, good man, I come from Magadah, which is where those images were carved. The image that looks like some guy out of Afghanistan, that's him. I come from Magadah, where I was born. Good man, there's a village there called Dwelling. And there's the son of an elder, whose name was Gopalaka. He sought to transform his community so they could enter the Buddha's Dharma. In other words, he wanted to serve. He wanted to, he, maybe he went into politics <laughs> to serve his community, to transform the community. He spoke Dharma for all the people in his hometown, each according to their ability to learn. In other words, he was a teacher. He explained the Mahayana teachings for his mother, for his father, for his family, for the Brahmins and others, so they could develop an interest in it. That is why I lived there and why I came from that place. So look, why did Maitreya, that not the fat one, but the, the tall one, why did he decide to become a spiritual person? Because he wanted to repay his parents' kindness for raising him. He wanted them to get interested in spirituality, to move away from life just as pursuing pleasure and running from pain, pursuing pleasure, running from pain, pursuing pleasure, running from pain, which is how most of the world passes their days. Right? He wanted them to look for something deeper, something true, something lasting, to speak Dharma for them, not only his family, but for the non-Buddhists. Brahmins mean Hindus, right, in India at the time. So they could develop an interest in the spiritual path. They could become better people. He wanted to teach everybody in his hometown in different ways, ways that they can learn. Today we had a brand new event. We had a Maine Coon cat come into the monastery <laughs> because Locke has, is raising a kitty. This cat is as long as this tape. Well, not quite. He's this long. When he's full grown, he's going to be that long. And this kitty, we had to bring him in today to walk around. He's on a leash. He's very well behaved. He's a boy, 10 months old. And he, he covered the place. He's like, he had it all cased out in about, uh, you know, in, in about, uh, about five, ten minutes. He had it all figured out. And uh, he, you know, he's a very self-respecting cat. But we were, I was looking at this cat and thinking, who lives inside that cat's body? Who's that who comes to the monastery? And he couldn't smell any other animals here, not even mice. We're currently mice-free at the moment. So... You know, he, I'm sure he was running around going, nothing to eat, you know. But we're, we're deciding whether or not he could possibly be a vegetarian. I'm, I'm not going to place my bets on the cat being a vegetarian. So, Some people can. David Rounds had two cats. One was a veggie. The other was a meat eater. Let it be. So, you know, each according to their potentials. This kitty was very well behaved in the monastery. Now, whether or not we're going to get a cat, we're not, but, you know, we had a visit from a, a feline living being today, and I was watching him, you know, check everything out, and so I was thinking, yeah, maybe I was a cat at one point, and I poked in a temple and, you know, learned that I wanted to hear the Dharma as well. Who knows? Who knows? So that was a first for us today. Connie talks about her puppy. Maybe someday the puppy's going to come. We don't know. Have to be very well behaved. So, yeah. So, what the reason I wanted to share this is because of filiality, Maitreya wanted to cultivate. This is the, the, the uh, what do you say, the uh, creation story of someone who became a bodhisattva on his way to becoming a Buddha. He got started on the path because he wanted to help his parents live good lives. They raised him. He wanted to give back to them. How interesting, you know, that this is, this is what our sutra says about this being who became the peace guy and is pictured as this big fat being. Yeah, for some people, that's what they want to see. 
And if it makes you feel happy, if it makes you feel, you know, on New Year's that this is a good thing, well, go for it. That's great. Um, other people, let's see here. Here we go. What else have we got? We got, let's see here. You ready? I came to say goodbye and introduce you to a new friend. Mr. Rabbit, I'll buy two off. He's done our. Happy New Year. Two Nian, Chi Xiang, Rui. Chin Nian, Bija Hao Guo. Amin Tuo Huo, Happy New Year. That's that. That's the message. So, however people can hear it, that's good. So here, yeah. <laughs> that's a lot of work to get that 50 seconds of, oh boy. So, this is how it started. You want to see the, the, the origin story of that video. There he is. <laughs> Happy New Year. Let me introduce you to a new friend. Mr. Rabbit, Mr. Rabbit, That's the B-roll from our video. <laughs> all right, all right, so there you go. Okay. So what did we learn? We've learned that uh, on Lunar New Year's, Zheng Yue, Chu Yi, on the first day of the new lunar year, is also Maitreya Bodhisattva's birthday on the Buddhist calendar. So they always coincide. So on one hand, the Buddhists say, you know, Happy New Year, like everybody. They don't say, Xin Nian Kuai Le, Rui Fa Sai. They don't say that. Uh, there we go. Gong Shi Fa We don't say Gong Shi Fa We say something else. But we also celebrate the, on our calendar, the coming into being of Maitreya Bodhisattva. But then you go, who's Maitreya Bodhisattva? Well, you got three. You got three. You got Fat Happy Buddha, who is patient who's got children and money and all that stuff, the peace guy. We've got Maitreya, who looks like a Western saint, who came into being because of filiality. And what else? we got the old fool. The old fool who wears tattered clothes and fills his belly with tasteless food. Here he is. This is he. Who is it? Well, this is Han Shan and Shida. People know about them. They are, uh, oh, here we go, sorry. I want this. Han Shan and Shida are actual kind of slightly mythological, slightly historical pr people. You see them? Zhejiang province in eastern China has a mountain called Tiantai Shan, Tiantai Mountain, the platform of heaven. And there's a temple there called Guoqing Monastery. It's been there since the year 500. So, 1,600-year-old temple, right? Wow, old temple. And this uh, Han Shan was called a mad poet, Cold Mountain. He writes these poems on the side of a cliff using charcoal and a rock. And 
he was, his poetry is considered kind of crazy. And Shirda was a monk from the monastery who liked Han Shan and kept him in food. Han Shan would occasionally run down, there they are, run down the hill, down the, the mountains and show up at the temple and grab some food and they'd chase him out and he would leave a poem behind. Well, we've actually seen that monastery, Guo Qing Si, in uh, Zhejiang, Heng Lai, Dharma Master Lai and I went to, to see it. And Master Hua had been there as a younger monk. So these guys are slightly legendary. You know, they're 1,500 years ago. They're supposed to have lived and we're still telling their stories today. But uh, in the monastery where this happened, uh, there is this this uh, kind of a picture with a verse and he says shi jian you ren bang wo qi wo ru wo xiao wo qing wo jian wo pian wo ru he chu zhi hu shi de yue zhi yao ren ta rang ta bi ta you ta nai ta jing ta bu yao li ta zai guo ji nian Right. That's, this is there in that temple. And it's that same spirit where he says, he says, coming up. People in the world slander me, ridicule me, abuse me, insult me, laugh at me, belittle me, look down on me, abuse me, and cheat me. What should I do? Shirdo says, all you have to do is just endure them. He says, let them do it. Go along, avoid them, be patient, respect them, pay no attention, come back in a few years, and look how the seeds they have planted turn out. So, Master Hua took this teaching and said, we should learn the skill of patience from Maitreya Bodhisattva. Isn't it wonderful? He's always laughing. He has such a pot belly. It says, Xin Guang Ti Pang. When your mind, when your heart is big, your body gets big as well. When your mind is broad, you have no, means you have no troubles, no afflictions. Maitreya is also known as Ajita, invincible. So he's got great strength of patience. So there we are. Pretty much uh, that's the story of Maitreya. So like I said, tonight is a storytelling night. Lots of stories. But it's, it's terrific to be able to kind of step into, step into this uh, tradition of stories and pass them on. And uh, the lesson that I take from this is how... Uh, how important it is to learn patience under insult. And as uh, this last year was hard to get through, right, the last couple of years. And the, the thing that disturbed me the most was how truth got turned upside down. Truth became optional. <laughs> there were truths that you could, uh, depending on, you know, just say COVID vaccine. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a time of polio. I was uh, just a kid in grade school when polio was a killer. Polio, if it didn't kill you, people, young children could get their, their legs all twisted. And they were put in what was called an iron lung. Some of us are old enough to remember. Remember the iron lung. And if you got polio and... Your brother could get it, but you wouldn't. Your sister could get it, and you wouldn't. It was a crippling, awful disease. And uh, then Jonas Salk, S-A-L-K, was the man who invented the Salk vaccine. Polio had a vaccine. And at first, it was done with shots. But then when I got my dose of polio vaccine, it was on a sugar cube. We lined up. Yeah, I think I was in second grade. And the school nurse had all these sugar cubes and little 
paper throwaway cups and they would squeeze a drop of sock vaccine onto the sugar cube. So we would file by, she would give us a cup, we would take the cup and here's a lump of sugar, you swallow it and that was how they delivered the vaccine to you and you weren't going to get polio. And Dr. Salk was considered a great hero of the culture. He would be the Dr. Fauci of his time, right? And uh, pr then in, as I progressed, I got measles vaccine, mumps vaccine, chicken pox vaccine, whooping cough vaccine, scarlet fever. I caught scarlet fever. I was miserable as a kid. I remember that. And let's see, so measles, mumps, chicken pox, whooping cough, diphtheria vaccine, and uh, rubella, which was another one, and then also, and polio, and also uh, smallpox. So, man, doo -doo 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 -doo, my arms, you know, all those needles, all those shots. And I was, I considered myself, because I didn't have any choice, my mom, you know, put me in to get these shots. But I was lucky. And you didn't question science, the value of it. You didn't, oh, and the vaccine, you know, there's microchips in there. They're keeping track of you because Bill Gates has slipped a microchip in the COVID vaccine. You know, it's like, what? That kind of nonsense. And then insane, chloroquine, chloroquine, chloroquine hydro, hydroxychloroquine, hydroxychloroquine is what? It is dewormer for horses, for large body animals. Some clown decided they would sell a lot of hydroxychloroquine and got it onto Fox News where this untruth was propagated, that if you take hydroxychloroquine, you'll be safe from COVID. It didn't, had nothing to do with COVID. It was for worming large bodied animals. And somebody made a lot of money selling hydroxychloroquine, but that misuntruth. So just a sample of how in our time, truth and falseness got flipped on its head. And there was a choice of truths. So in Chinese, they say, we outsmart ourselves. We got too smart for our own good. And this is a difficult time that we've been going through. So what I learned from that experience is to say, keep an open mind and listen, listen carefully. And it's people who go to school, who study to learn things are not bad. It's another example of how true and false gets flipped. Somehow we suspect experts. That's not a healthy, there's no healthy future for that. I saw a, a story uh, an opinion, this was a, an opinion article in the New York Times the other day, they said by the year 20, let's see, we're at 2023 right now, they said in the next 10 years, college enrollments are going to be cut by half. Why? People aren't going to want to go to college. This poison in America now, in, not only in America, of suspecting knowledge that we're called anti-intellectual, that's going to cut in. Colleges are going to be closing. Why? Students aren't going. They're not going to apply because it's just like, why do you want to be an egghead? Why do you want to be a bookworm? We don't trust smart people anymore. We don't trust knowledge and learning. That's not a good future for our culture. So please keep your sights. Your, who, those of you raising kids, knowledge is good. This bodhisattva who we listen to tonight is called Jirlin Pusa, forest of knowledge, right? So only through knowledge can we find new solutions to problems. Otherwise, COVID would have killed more millions. As it was, because of things like hydroxychloroquine, a million Americans died. Can you imagine how many could have saved, how many elders, if the leaders of the country at the time had said, oh, let's listen to the experts. Let's find out how to beat this pandemic, the way we've beaten polio, the way we almost eradicated smallpox. Smallpox killed so many people, 
And it was tragic because you got it and you suffered, right? Well, we nearly eradicated. Malaria is another one on the way out. Mosquito-borne illness, right? So now, because of this insanity about people suspecting vaccines are bad, anti-vaxxers, measles is coming back. We almost beat it, but it's coming back. So let's not turn our backs on learning, on knowledge. It's good to support science, to support education. Pay our teachers. Pay teachers to stay in the classroom. Teachers are suffering. We've got teachers sitting in the back of our room tonight who know what that's like when you have to bring your own books into the classroom because there's no budget. What kind of a country can possibly progress if we don't teach young people? If you want to teach young people, we have to provide materials and salaries for teachers so they can survive in the classroom. It's heroic to be a teacher uh, with all the pressure against you now. I am a classroom teacher at various lists. I taught third grade and I taught college. And boy, oh boy, when you realize how hard it is to survive if you love learning, it's, that's not a, it's not a happy direction for our country or for the world. So anyway, forest of, of knowledge bodhisattva uh, is speaking through me at the moment, saying let's support, let's make forests of knowledge grow all over the planet. It's like forests of trees. Okay, time is up. Uh, I want to repeat our uh, information for tomorrow, 9 a.m. Be happy to open the doors. You want to come light incense and bow. We'll be here until 10.30. The monks are going to have lunch. 12.30, Jin Foshir is going to recite the Buddha's name. You come and join. Welcome. Then uh, we're going to close up at 5. Right? Then there's a sutra... Sutra lecture tomorrow night, and let's see here, what have we got? Uh, here we go. Here are the rabbit videos. Ah, okay, hold on here. Bottleneck Blues, that's not it. That's not it. Here we go. Uh, well, that was last week. That was our good karma music from last week. Let's, let's uh, go out and take a chance. Let's see here what we got. Good karma music on dharmaradio.org. That's our website. dharmaradio.org. Okay, if you go out to good karma music, you can find all the stories of good deeds that people have done in order to get music, including three songs from a Catholic monk, Father Cyprian Concilio, down in Big Sur, uh, in the, the New Camaldoli Benedictine Catholic Hermitage. Father Cyprian is a dear friend of ours. He sings my songs, I sing his songs, and uh, we share our music. Okay, here we go. I give away what I don't use to those who are in need. I see a person walking in the pouring rain without an umbrella, I give them mine. I offer my jacket and tent to a homeless person. I cover homeless people sleeping without a blanket in winter, a warm quilt. It's not the case that I hold on to possessions thinking I might need it later. I give away my own blessings without hesitation. That's anonymous from Las Vegas. Oh my goodness. Good heart. Let's give them some music. Whew, okay. Uh, I wanted to share, let's see here, just to prove how Catholic monks sing Buddhist songs. Here we go. Let's find uh, Cyprian Concilio, Compassionate and Wise. Here it is. Okay, I'm going to click on this and share the link and ask Jason to put this out onto YouTube, if you will. I'll put it in our chat here. Here it is. 
There it is. Can you grab that off the chat in Zoom? I, c I don't, I don't want to put it out into YouTube myself because I'll get feedback, but if you could send that out. If, if you can't, just go to YouTube, go Cyprian Concilio, type in compassionate and wise. Listen to what Father Cyprian says at the start here. song was translated and adapted from the Chinese Buddhist Metta Sutta by our Chinese Buddhist monk friend, Reverend Heng Shur, who adopted a, a melody from the Canadian singer-songwriter Lorena McKennett from her setting of the poem of St. John of the Cross, The Dark Night of the Soul. <clears throat> Heng Shur graciously allowed John and I to record this with our own arrangement on our album, Compassionate and Wise. And as Heng Shur explained it to us, he said, this is the Buddhist version of intercessory prayer. For an introduction to it, we added something that I learned from my sister and brother, monks and nuns at Shantivanam, our ashram in South India. It's called the Mahamrityum Jaya Mantra, the great mantra for conquering death, taken from the Rig Veda and the Yajur Veda. May we be liberated from the bonds of death like a ripe fruit dropping from a tree. Okay, so just to say, that's, that's out there. This is Father Cyprian singing dedication of merit, which he calls compassionate and wise, and actually I prefer his version, it's really beautiful. He's, it's much more uh, rhythmic, and here we go, I want you to hear how he s makes it sound. Okay, I'm going to tease you. Stop it right there. Sorry. Tease. Oh, don't stop it. Don't stop. Oh. So you'll have to go listen on your own, but it's worth it. Oh, it's so good. And uh, what I wanted to say is now is our chance to transfer merit, but we're not going to do it with the, the dedication of merit. May every living being. We're going to do it with one with a tune aimed at covid uh, healing, healing from COVID-19. And this is a mantra from a Buddha called Medicine Buddha, who is the Buddha whose vows are dedicated to healing. And we've got it in Sanskrit, which is the original, one of the original Buddhist languages. And we do it three times, but the important thing is what you do with your heart as you sing this which is you make a wish. You heard Father Cyprian say intercessory prayer, right? That's the Catholic way of saying, uh, Lord, hear our prayer. You know, please, we want to pray on behalf of so-and-so. So-and-so is having surgery. So-and-so is experiencing depression. You know, Lord, hear our prayer. So we do the same thing and we make a wish and we say, I'd like to send out the happiness of coming together on this cold uh, January night here in downtown Berkeley with our friends and family, generations here. All that goodness I'd like to share to make a better world. I dedicate it to, you fill in the blank, with the wish that, and you fill in the blank. So this is your part. It's interactive, it's intercessory prayer, okay? So we're, we'll sing it together and uh, the important part is the wish that you make, right? So here's your chance. Here we go, ready? Om Namo Bhagavate Vaisatya Guru Vaiturya Prabharajaya Arhate samyak samudaya pratyata om Vaisaji, Vaisaji, 
So it's finally come, a new year. Mm, you gonna make it a better year? Or is it gonna be the same old stuff? Rabbits, you know, we're pretty intelligent. We've always got plan B. We got no weapons, so we need an escape route, you know? We always got a back door. Yeah, 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 that's the way we, you know, escape. Yep, what do you think we're doing with those ears? I got a Wi-Fi antenna up there. I'm. Uh, Planning to stream Netflix tonight. Uh, uh, oh, you're not supposed to say that. Oh, okay. That was my secret. I shouldn't have told you. Okay, never mind. Never mind. Uh, we watch all the Warriors games. Uh, yeah, you know, Steph Curry. Yeah, so. All right, never mind. Happy New Year, everybody. And uh, if, if you can be patient and not get angry, it's a better year already. Okay, amidovo, amidovo. Okay, see you later. Good luck. Drive carefully. Have a good start to the year. See you tomorrow. Come light incense. Come recite with Jin Fo. He's going, ah, me, to, fo, ah, me, to, fo, ah, me. So, yep, yep, yep. Okay. Happy New Year. Happy Year of the Rabbit. Hope it's better than the last one. Okay. You want to bow to the Buddha? Let's do it. Here we go. Okay. That's what they say about rabbits is they're very clever. Okay, bow in respect to the Venerable Master. Okay, that's going to do it for us for tonight. Happy New Year, everybody. Amidofo.